Great event uh, right at the end of term. You can imagine if we were near the beginning of term, how many more people will be here. But this just shows how interesting this event is going to be. So I'm Laura McDonald. I'm director of the Institute of Political Economy, uh, which is organizing this workshop uh, titled Cor Corporate Welfare, Public Policies for Private Corporations. And this is an event that we do every year around uh, the work of a visiting professor um, so this year we were uh, luckily, lucky enough to have with us uh, Dr. Kevin Farnsworth from uh, the University of Sheffield in Britain. And so uh, I'll just introduce everybody in turn, but we're, uh, basically Kevin's been working on this concept of corporate welfare, which is a pretty fascinating one, and it's great to have this theme kind of resurrecting, I think, uh, which to me is uh, reminds me of of uh, some of the politics of the 1970s, am I right, Kevin? Uh, you know, corporate welfare, corporate bums um, that came out in Canada, and we kind of lost sight of that uh, approach to some extent. But I'm hoping that Kevin and others will be bringing it back. And uh, I like the image of the fat cat capitalist um, who is often, despite um, you know ideas about getting rid of the state, in fact, uh, under recent versions of neoliberal capitalism, we see capitalists feeding at the state trough, uh, much as they uh, accuse the, the poor of doing. So uh, today we'll have three speakers. First, Kevin, who will speak a little longer because he is our visitor, uh, speaking on the topic of, uh, topic of public policies for private corp companies. Okay, never mind. You can read the titles. They'll read you the titles. Um, so Kevin, as I said, is a professor at the University of Sheffield. He, um, Sheffield University, he did his PhD at Bath, and he's the author of a couple of recent books. He, in particular, he's been working on the effects of the uh, recent global financial crisis and teaching in that area. So it's been really great to have Kevin with us. And uh, rounding out this discussion, we have two other interesting people working in diverse areas that uh, we thought would fit well in with this topic. Uh, first, we have Marc-André Gagnon, who's a professor in the School of Public Policy and Administration here at Carleton, who's very well known for his great work on the pharmaceutical industry and um, uh, public policies that support private, private sector interests, I believe, we'll see. And finally, we have um, Jen Moore, who's the Latin American uh, staff program coordinator for Mining Watch Canada. Um, Jen uh, worked for many years as a journalist in Latin America, and so she has extensive research and ag advocacy uh, experience, and she's going to be speaking about um, <laughs> the uh, Ottawa support for Canadian mining industries in the Americas and perhaps elsewhere. So over to you, Kevin. Okay. Could I move this up a little? Yeah. We can edit this bit out afterwards. But. Um. Is that okay? If I it's still alright? Okay. And if I move forward, that's okay. Right. Okay. Well, um, thank you so much for coming along uh, to hear this presentation uh, today, or this series of presentations. Um, I want to pay, say a, a special thank you to Laura for organizing this, and in particular to Donna, who uh, has disappeared, um, for not only organizing this, but the fantastic um, graphic design work that she's done on this poster. Um, thank you as well to uh, Marc-André and um, to Jen uh, for coming along and, 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 and um, uh, sharing this session on, um, on corporate welfare. Um, I feel very privileged to have a session on corporate welfare because um, I've been working on this area for some time. I've actually been interested in the whole issue of corporate welfare um, really um, since the mid-1990s. Uh, I grew up um, with, um, actually not so much with, but under um, Thatcher. Uh, and um, so Thatcherism and Reaganism. And um, I was completing my PhD during the disappointing years of Blairism and New Labour. Um, and what's really interesting about this period, this period of um, neoliberalism that transcended each of those administrations, and of course you witness your own version of that as well in Canada, is, um, is a propagation of a number of myths. 
Uh, the first myth being that, um, that private mar markets operate more efficiently than the public sector. The second myth that, um, that, that social welfare is problematic for a number of reasons. It's problematic because it undermines the private sector, it undermines competitiveness, uh, but it also undermines the social fabric. And the third myth that businesses and citizens would be better off if um, to quote uh, Ronald Reagan, um, if uh, the government got out of the way. So these myths, I think, are really interesting. And they're really interesting when we see uh, or think about uh, those myths in light of the financial crisis. Because what the financial crisis means, of course, is that, um, is that uh, the uh, governments were forced to uh, bail out the, uh, in some cases, most successful parts of the economy uh, to huge expense. So, um, so this got me even more interested in corporate welfare um, sort of since the 1990s. And, um, and uh, as Laura said, I've been doing some work on corporate welfare um, uh, really over the last um, four years. Uh, I, I did a comparative book, um, which made use of comparative data. Comparative data actually in this area is, uh, is actually extremely poor, and I'll um, talk a little bit about that. But more recently, I've been doing a, a case study of the UK. And so what I want to do today is to share some data from those projects. And um, I've even been able to um, uh, put in some data from Canada as well. Um, so, um, so hopefully that will uh, also be of interest to you. Uh, as Laura said, uh, the, uh, the, the, the concept of corporate welfare actually begins in Canada uh, in the 1970s. So corporate welfare begins uh, with, uh, with David Lewis and the NDP. And, um, and originally, the term corporate welfare was uh, coined in order to draw attention to the fact that corporations were making demands of the state. But Politically, we actually didn't see that. Politically, there was much more focus on, um, on the poor. So um, David Lewis uh, put this issue of corporate welfare at the heart of the um, early 1970s election campaigns, which actually, through our present eyes, looks pretty radical, um, and actually far more radical than I think um, we were seeing in Europe at the time, and certainly, since, um, and, and certainly um, far more radical than we've seen ever since. The notion of corporate welfare since the 1970s has traveled two ways. First of all, it's traveled to the right. So it's actually the political right that talk about corporate welfare now, much more than the, much more than the political left. Um, corporate welfare is a, is a term that actually um, is one of those uh, um, relatively unique terms that unite the left and right in opposition, albeit for different reasons. And I'll say a bit more about that um, possibly in the question time or, or maybe towards the end of the, uh, the presentation. So it's a term that's important for the left and the right. Um, there are still organizations doing work on, on corporate welfare. Um, the ones that, leading, that are leading the way now is the Cato Institute in the US and the Fraser Institute in, in, in Canada. Both talk a lot about corporate welfare, but, it's, but they talk about corporate welfare in order to expose the undeserving wealthy uh, in the same way that they might also talk about the undeserving poor. Um, and so this is a reason to, um, or there's a justification there um, at the heart of the debate to keep um, state out of, um, uh, uh, so f from interfering with um, corporations and spending tax dollars on, um, on corporations. This is what David Lewis said in the 1970s. I want to read it to you because, again, it, it, I think it's an incredibly radical statement. Um, the nature of the corporate welfare state has been obscured by the traditional moralizing of big business about the virtues of free enterprise, while the... Uh, they publicly denounce, de denounce increasing, uh, increased government expenditure, particularly in the form of social welfare. These champions of free enterprise actively lobby the government for incentive grants, research grants, and tax concessions, and all manner of assistance. So um, here, Lewis is pointing to uh, the, the, the problem of corporations um, effectively making use of the state, fleecing the state. Um, and, um, and at the same time, it being the case in, 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 in denial about that, actually obscuring the fact that that's actually what's, um, what's, uh, what's going on. So 
why corporate welfare then? Why, why, why do I want to look at corporate welfare? Um, the reason why I'm arguing that we need to bring corporate welfare in is that um, it's not because corporate welfare is, a, um, is an uncontroversial term. It's not because it's an ideal term necessarily, um, but it's the closest we have, I think, to a, a, a term that helps to bring together a number of different literatures that are, that are really important in this area. Um, the subsidies literature is useful and draws attention to the various ways in which states support um, corporations, but it's narrow. It's far too narrow, I think. Um, it neglects a whole range of other, pr other uh, public policy that, um, that um, the, 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 the state is responsible for. Industrial policy literature does highlight the importance of, um, uh, of the state in trying to um, assist corporations and increase the competitiveness and productivity of corporations, uh, but it neglects social policy. And then we have the welfare state literature, and especially the expansion of the welfare state literature through comparative analysis to the uh, varieties of capitalism literature that some of you will know, um, which is really useful in making sense of the impact of social policy on issues like productivity and competitiveness, but it neglects a whole range of other public policies. So corporate welfare, for me, brings together different literatures um, in order to try to draw attention to corporate welfare. I argue that we need a new discourse, um, and that discourse is, me, is, is, is missing now. We don't even have the apparatus to begin to conceptualize the kinds of things that I'm um, trying to uh, talk about here. Um, we need a new discourse which facilitates greater understanding of the relationship between business, um, citizens, and governments, and we have to investigate how corporate welfare might be utilized in order to um, reduce corporate harm um, and also to increase uh, social justice. And I argue that public policies need to be designed so that they foster more responsible corporate beh behavior. I'm not here, incidentally, uh, and in this work, necessarily condemning corporate welfare, because actually, I think that corporations need the state. Uh, and this is clear, actually, if we, if we think about the works, uh, work of Marx, but it's also in clear if we th think about the work of, um, of Adam Smith. Um, Corporations need the state, and, um, and uh, they need the state, so then we have to ask questions about what we can expect from corporations, um, but we also need to ask questions about how we can provide um, provision to corporations which doesn't undermine um, uh, social equality, that doesn't in, in, uh, undermine the needs of citizens. Uh, which brings me on to the definition of corporate welfare that I'm working with. Corporate welfare exists where governments design or deliver public policy in such a way as to meet the specific needs and or preferences, and preferences are important, obviously, in, in, in relation to pol uh, political lobbying, um, of private businesses, or otherwise socialize the costs and risks associated with private investment and profit making. Another myth is that private corporations take on huge amounts of risk and are innovative in their own right. Actually, they, um, the, the risk that they bear is often shouldered um, throughout society more generally, and in, a, and, and, in, and in some instances, they bear absolutely no risk at all, or very little risk. Not personal risk and not risk to the corporations, because the risk is socialized. And again, we can say a bit more about that a bit later. Corporate welfare assists corporations as well through their life course. This is really important, I think, because sometimes corporations will say that they don't need the state. Um, the CEO of Northern Rock Bank, two years before being, being taken over by, um, by, by the state, was making this kind of argument that corporations sh don't need the state, the, uh, that the state should step um, uh, to one side, should actually deregulate. Of course, the result of that was the, um, was the banking crisis. The point is that corporations, even if they don't think they need the state at that particular time, might well come to realize that actually they do need the state. And they're more likely to need the state um, during the early stages as well of their, of their existence to, to help to um, um, remove the risk. Um, so um, to go on with the definition, it makes possible the birth of corporations and meets their evolving needs from their youth to their maturity. It provides advice, mediates their risks, and provides additional support during difficult times. It keeps some companies in life support and assists some companies in their death. Again, we can un unpack that uh, a bit later um, in the questions. Um, why do corporations 
Uh, sorry, why do governments provide corporate uh, welfare? Well, we have some um, rich uh, theoretical literature here. Uh, of course, for Marx, governments always act in the interests, ultimately, of, of, of capital or of business. Um, and um, for neo-Marxists, too, the interests of the state and um, governing parties are tied um, to the interests of business. The more successful is business, the higher is in levels of investment, the more likely political parties are going to um, win re-election. And incidentally, it's not just Marxists that are arguing this. Charles Lindblom is a pluralist, um, one of the um, major pluralists, actually, that actually helped to put pluralism on the uh, political agenda, um, writing with Dahl. Uh, Lindblom made a very similar argument. He actually, argue, he actually stated that, um, that they were wrong in, 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 in assuming that business was just any old um, lobby group um, and, and instead argued that business is a privileged interest. But, tried to, uh, but made this argument based on a kind of structural argument that actually um, governments need investment, citizens need corporate investment, they need companies to be profitable, at least within capitalism, otherwise everyone suffers. So it's this kind of argument. Um, Organized business is also uh, incredibly powerful, though, because they're able to make use of a wide range of resources in order to try to um, squeeze more provision from the state, lower taxation, lower regulations, and higher benefits. And something that I argue is that in responding to this, governments actually help to, um, um, help to create needs. If, government, if businesses um, have an investment model based on low regulations, low taxation, low wage costs, then that's what they need. They will continue to need that, and actually if they don't get that, then some of them, um, of course, um, will, uh, will, will, either, will either reduce their levels of investment or go elsewhere. Uh, so, um, so these two arguments are really important, but I also argue that institutions do matter here that the power of business is variable over time and um, between policy areas and between um, countries as well. The reason is that business power is mediated by um, political institutions. Uh, the needs of business uh, also um, can be satisfied in different ways. The basic need of, uh, of business is to make money, is profit. Um, but that begs the question of how much profit they need to make, and it also um, raises the question of how they make profit, and they might make profit in different ways, and public policy might facilitate the making of that profit in different ways. Um, governments pursue different economic strategies, I argue, uh, and those strategies themselves shape business strategies and business needs, as I've already mentioned, and social policies can help to reconcile uh, what otherwise can be quite fiercely uh, contested needs of citizens and business. They help to reconcile these two, um, the needs of both of these groups. Um, from the theoretical to, um, I suppose, the more normative, why do governments provide corporate welfare? Um, they provide corporate welfare in order to induce or facilitate new investment, to boost national and international productivity or competitiveness and profitability. They um, provide corporate welfare in order to, to um, protect and, pres uh, and, and, and or preserve uh, strategically important businesses in, in, in certain sectors. They do so in order to socialize the risks uh, that otherwise confront business, which I've already talked about. They do so in order to protect employment. And this is also something that's important not to forget. Um, the discussion of corporate welfare that does exist, I think, often assumes that actually um, it's businesses that are arguing for higher levels of corporate welfare, and sometimes it is. But actually, sometimes it's trade unions, because obviously um, subsidies can actually make the difference between a job loss or, or, or continuing employment. And that's, I think, really, employ uh, really important. In fact, the biggest tensions can sometimes exist um, within the business community, not necessarily between capital and labor. And I think that's something that we need to um, take into account. Business uh, governments provide provision in order to influence um, production and manipulate markets, a, a key area and, 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 and um, long-established area of, 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 uh, of, of corporate welfare here is the agricultural sector, where, um, where, where huge amounts of subsidies are paid out. Um, they might do in order to assist uh, corporate friends, and they might do so in order to uh, offset the costs associated with taxation. The argument here is that governments can aid uh, uh, corporations in different ways. Even if they tax them, they can actually provide provision that actually off helps to offset um, that taxation. 
And they might do in order to increase legitimacy. And this goes back to the sort of the arguments of Habermas and James O'Connor. So governments can intervene uh, in different ways to, um, uh, to provide provision. They might intervene um, through taxation, through regulation, um, through provision. Um, and, they, um, and there is space here, there is, there is capacity for governments to provide in one area and not another. In other words, there's, there's capacity for trade-offs. And that's also important. Um, so, biz so governments might service the needs of business in very different ways. And different states have different patterns of uh, public policy that help to, to um, uh, service the needs of business in different ways. Some states choose to go down the low-cost, low-tax, low-regulation route, and other states don't. They go down the route of higher levels of productivity. The, um, both uh, systems fulfill the needs of business but they fulfill different needs. And again, that's one of the arguments I think we need to engage is in how they might more effectively meet those needs in order to uh, also meet the needs of citizens. Something else I argue uh, in the book and, and, and map out is that actually corporate um, welfare exists with social welfare along a continuum. That actually, although the assumption is often made that the state will make this kind of provision and this kind of provision only services the needs of either capital or labor, I think that's not quite right. Um, what this uh, um, uh, diagram lays out is that um, social welfare uh, exists um, or might be perceived to exist at different forms of the, uh, different sort of extents of the con uh, 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 continuum. Um, but that actually, in terms of the provision that we see, very few forms of provision uh, exclusively service either in the interests of business or the interests of capital. And here, um, we have to make another distinction between business needs in general and the needs of individual corporations. So um, there is provision that's necessary for um, capital um, in general, infrastructure spending, legal instruments. Without these, corporations couldn't exist. Um, but when we look down at the level of the individual corporation, I think this is going to um, uh, be uh, elaborated in, 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 the, um, in subsequent talks. Um, there is a whole range of provision that, um, that benefits individual corporations, but doesn't necessarily benefit all uh, corporations in the same way. Um, so um, in setting out the continuum, I want to uh, emphasize the, um, the, 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 the possible trade-offs uh, and the relationship between different forms of provision. Um, the most, um, sort of, uh, the purest form of corporate welfare, I think, is, is a subsidy or grant. But I've already indicated that a subsidy or grant could actually be beneficial to citizens as well, at least to um, people working in within, within a corporation. Um, there the are also going to be costs to that as well, um, but, um, but there could be benefits there. And then the personal social services being the purest form of social welfare that brings fewest benefits to corporations, uh, but not corporations that contract with the state in order to deliver social care services, mind you. So here again, you know, there's a, there's a difference between individual um, capital and, um, and, and um, or capitals, individual corporations and um, corporations in general. Okay. That's the, um, the sort of the, the, the background. In the next 10 minutes, and um, hopefully I'll be able to do this in 10 minutes, I want to turn to the data. And um, I, want to, um, I want to, first of all, emphasize something uh, which is really important here. Um, my uh, academic background is, the, is social policy in the welfare state. And, uh, and the welfare state is one of those controversial areas of the state um, or, 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 or contested area of the state uh, where there's huge amounts of work. Uh, I, could, I could tell you almost anything about a welfare, uh, uh, someone on social welfare. Um, we have research to tell us what time people on benefits get up out of bed in the morning, um, what they do with their life, whether they feel, whether they're um, incentivized or disincentivized by um, the benefits they receive. Um, we're pretty um, aware about how much all, uh, benefits cost, although most people over, uh, overestimate how much is actually paid on social welfare because um, of the uh, political environment in which we exist. We know very little about corporate welfare. We know very little about corporate subsidies. Um, these issues are not placed on the political agenda in the same way. Um, they appear much more on the political agenda in North America, mind you. In, in, in Europe, um, uh, corporate welfare isn't really um, um, uh, utilized at all. 
but that doesn't mean that other, t other, uh, other terms um, are, are, are used in substitute for corporate welfare. The fact is, actually, subsidies we know very little about. Even the most obvious form of corporate welfare um, we know very little about. Um, and so there's very little work. So this um, is, is, is what I've been trying to do um, over the last few years, in, uh, few years as I said, in, time, in trying to um, look at um, uh, corporate welfare and try to measure corporate welfare somehow. So not just seeing, not just looking at the, the, um, the purpose of corporate welfare, but trying to um, um, balance the debate by looking at how much corporate welfare is worth. I can tell you that it's extremely difficult. The data is either incomplete um, or it doesn't exist. Um, it's often shrouded in secrecy and comparative data is really problematic as well. Because why do we have international data? Um, the WTO and the European um, com um, Commission um, collect subsidy data, but they're mainly interested in trade distortion. They're mainly interested in big subsidies that go to corporations that distort trade. They're not really interested in looking beyond that at actually what corporations extract from the state. Um, so the data is really problematic. I've got around that by um, uh, beginning to look at individual case studies, and, uh, that's, and, and my first case study is the UK, and I'm going to share some data from the UK. Before that, though, I want to share some um, more comparative data, looking at what we do know. And I want to begin with the crisis, um, the economic crisis that struck from 2007, 2008. And I want to remind you of the costs of that crisis. Uh, this is um, at the, um, uh, within a, a period of neoliberal globalization where corporations don't need the state. Um, I want to draw your attention to the huge costs of that assumption. Um, the huge costs of withdrawing regulations from corporations because corporations do better without the state. And I want to draw your attention in particular to, um, to the UK because the UK took one of the hardest hits as a result of um, the economic crisis. The 81.6% um, of GDP is the um, IMF's estimate of the UK's exposure to the crisis. This is twice as much as the entire government spends in any one year on everything it does. Um, so that's 81%, that's 81.6%. Um, Canada, which largely escaped the banking crisis, 25% uh, of GDP. Now this isn't necessarily real, um, exp it's exposure, but it's not real money. Uh, but upfront government financing is. And here, I want to draw your attention to um, Canada. 10% um, of, um, of GDP is the upfront costs that the Canadian government spent in, in order to try to uh, buy its way out of crisis, which I believe is, around, is about the same uh, as the uh, cost of the entire health budget. Um, the UK, at um, almost 20% of GDP, um, worth about 250 to 300 billion pounds, um, uh, which is equivalent to the health and education budgets and a bit of social security thrown in. You know, these are huge amounts of money. And the real cost, of course, is actually in the cuts to social welfare that have been made now and rolled, off, rolled uh, across a number of countries. Um, so that's the crisis. Uh, but the crisis is a blip, isn't it? It's, um, it's, it's just one of those things that happen um, you know, very infrequently. This is the worst crisis since the 1930s. So, um, so governments don't often, don't, don't um, usually put this amount of money into their economy in bailing out corporations. Well, they don't, um, but they do uh, make provision in other areas. Uh, and it, this is comparative data again. Um, either my eyesight's getting worse or this is slightly blurry. Um, it's perfectly clear on my screen, but, um, the, um, but I think you can see the, the, um, the figures here. Uh, this is subsidies, vast underestimate of, of what governments actually, um, uh, the, the provision that, that um, governments make to corporations. Um, but nonetheless, it's the best data that we have. What we see is that subsidies over time are reasonably um, static. And what this also interestingly illustrates is that the crisis doesn't make much difference. Why? Because as I said, subsidy data doesn't include a whole range of things that governments do. It doesn't include capital grants. Um, it doesn't include, ne it doesn't include um, um, governments buying shares in corporations necessarily. It doesn't include a whole range of things that governments um, do. So this is subsidies from one um, under-researched area, but let me talk about a much more over-researched area. Um, unemployment benefits. And let's make some comparisons with unemployment benefits. Um, Sweden, one of the most generous welfare systems um, in, the, in the world, um, provides more in subsidies than it does in unemployment benefits. Um, Germany provides more 
uh, sorry, um, in Germany, um, subsidies slightly lower than, um, than, than unemployment benefits. Um, in the US, unemployment benefits higher than subsidies, um, but mainly because of the crisis and the um, expansion of unemployment benefits. Uh, why? As part of the stimulus package, not because of the needs of people. Uh, in, um, in Canada, Canada spends more on subsidies than it does on unemployment benefits, and the UK spends more in subsidies than it does on unemployment benefits. And subsidies, as I said, only present a very partial picture. This uh, uh, looks at subsidies, the lighter blue colour, uh, but also looks at capital grants. So this is provision that's given to companies in order to um, subsidise uh, investment. And you can see that that inflates the overall value of the package quite significantly. And then we have issues like tax expenditures. Uh, tax expenditures, um, so tax uh, uh, benefits given to corporations um, the UK is an outlier here. Uh, this is from the OECD, and a study from the OECD, which actually didn't include many countries. Um, the UK, it, it looks like a generous tax uh, benefits system, um, especially compared to, um, to, to Germany. But the OECD explained this away by saying that the UK was probably just being a bit more upfront about what it was providing, rather than actually that um, it, was, um, it, was a, it was such an outlier. Um, okay, I'm running out of time a little bit, so I'm going to have to really speed up here. Um, in terms, I, I want to just quickly run through a number of other, be other, uh, other benefits. Uh, government loans, government loans and guarantees to the private sector. Um, the government, governments provide loans typically at below market rates to corporations. That results in a subsidy here worth £4.6 billion in the UK in 2011-2012. Um, but it also provides provision which subsidizes, which, which, uh, especially as a result of the, global, uh, of the crisis, provides cheap money to banks, which then can be loaned on at a more expensive rate. So there's a subsidy from consumers. Um, governments, uh, during this particular time as well, are typically lending at a higher rate th uh, uh, from, from uh, external sources at a, at, a, at a higher rate of interest, and they're uh, subsequently um, providing to the banks, which results in another um, uh, subsidy. I'm not going to go through the figures because I haven't got time. Um, equity financing, um, buying up shares, um, which are um, likely to be um, worth a lot less when governments actually come around to sell them, especially when they're taking over bad assets from, um, from, from banks. Um, wage subsidies, this is a really interesting one. Active social policy, which is being rolled, across, rolled out across the world, um, is a way of trying to use the welfare benefit system to um, price people into work. The result of that in the UK is that half of those um, in employment, um, uh, sorry, uh, uh, sorry, half of the total income of the uh, of twenty percent of workers is provided by the state in tax credits and housing benefits. This is a massive wage subsidy to individuals. Forty percent of all workers receive some form of state top-up benefit in the UK now. Um, um, corporate taxation, I've already talked about tax breaks. Uh, tax avoidance, we also have to factor in that, uh, in, into this. Um, health. Uh, the public health service in, 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 in countries like the um, UK and Canada save um, corporations money, uh, especially when compared with the US. And um, the amount there we're looking at is about £5 billion. Um, pounds. Um, for the for the UK in, in savings, and that's after taking into account the 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 um, the, 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 the uh, contributions that corporations make. Um, we have insurance services, advocacy and support, um, education and training and procur uh, procurement. Um, the overall estimate uh, that I reach is about. £160 billion in the UK alone, which is equivalent to 10% of UK GDP, roughly the size of the combined health and defence budgets, and is about £60 billion more than corporations contributing taxation. So again, you know, we have to really take these things into account. Um, the last couple of minutes, I want to share some, um, some data that, um, that um, I, I looked at specifically for this, well, I, in, the, in, in the case of Canada. Um, this, uh, on the, on the left-hand side, these are the uh, biggest corporate beneficiaries of state provision, um, direct state provision in the UK. Um, in the, on the right-hand side, um, the, um, the biggest beneficiaries of, st uh, 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 of state largesse in Canada. Um, it's, um, it's from the Fraser Institute uh, and, and, and covers a, a, um, a larger um, sort of time uh, period. What's really interesting here is actually not just looking at the numbers, 
these are really significant, mind you. Uh, but also, um, Rolls-Royce, uh, Bombardier, and Ford um, are, are currently um, um, not only um, uh, um, having contributions from the UK government, but also the Canadian government. Uh, this is, again, something else, we, something that's really under research. And I think it would be really useful to look at this, to look at actually um, corporate um, uh, provision um, in, a number of different, uh, in a number of different states. And I want to, um, second to last slide, uh, talk about Amazon. Because Amazon is a really interesting case study. Amazon was recently um, accused, uh, along with Google and Starbucks in the UK, of um, using aggressive tax avoidance measures. Uh, Amazon paid 1.8 million pounds in tax uh, on sales of 3.3.5 billion pounds in 2011 in the UK, effective an effective corporate tax rate of 0.05 percent. Corporate tax in the UK is low, but it's not that low. Um, they should have been paying about 23 um, percent. That same year, though, it also made a claim and was awarded 7.7 million pounds from the Scottish government and 11 million pounds from the Welsh Assembly to help build two new um, warehouses. Again, we have to look at the complete picture here. If Amazon um, um, uh, want the, the, that provision, then surely they have to contribute more. Um, and that brings me to the conclusions. Uh, as I mentioned before, corporate welfare, I think, is essential, uh, is essential to modern capitalism. That's not a, a new thing. Um, uh, corporations couldn't exist without, form, without um, state assistance. Its value to business and, uh, and, and cost to the taxpayers is largely hidden, though. Uh, subsidies and direct grants cost more than unemployment benefits in many states. Businesses extract far more from the UK, and I'm sure elsewhere, than they presently contribute. Um, corporate welfare, I think, can be used in a way that would actually underpin stability and socially sustainable investment, but it can also facilitate short-termism and predatory capitalism. Uh, and that's a debate, that I get, debate, again, that I think we need to have. We need to research corporate welfare and engage in a more informed debate about what would constitute the appropriate balance between corporate welfare and social welfare um, in terms of tax contributions and overall consumption, and... Um, and how corporate welfare might be utilized in order to underpin more sustainable um, and more equitable growth in future. Uh, one of the things that we could do is make corporate welfare more conditional on um, uh, for paid, so paid to corporate citizens or made to corporate citizens who um, fulfill particular duties. And maybe again, we can, um, we can uh, discuss that in the questions later. Okay, I'm going to hand now um, over to Mark. Okay. Thank you. I like these mics. Remi reminds me when I was in a punk rock band at the time. <laughs> okay, there's weird things happening. <laughs> Jason, I'm counting on you. So I need to use this one? Yeah. Fantastic. Well, hi everybody, it's a real pleasure. Yeah, you can take it, please. It's a real pleasure for me to be here. Thank you very much. Discussing the, the Canadian pharmaceutical sector, I went from a knowledge-based economy to corporate welfare. So, so this is a bit less conceptual, a bit more empirical about what's going on here in Canada. So in terms of outline, uh, uh, how is the Canadian pharmaceutical sec uh, sector a, a success story? What went wrong? And then the costs and benefits of what we call innovation policy, or, or we could see the, the corporate welfare in the sector. And then just a, a, a quick look at emerging trends. Um, the strength of the knowledge-based uh, economy in the pharmaceutical sector is just, you know, the narrative. It's a, well, before 1987, the focus was on the generic sector. You, we had stuff like compulsory licensing, so possibility to circumvent uh, patents for drugs. Uh, and under Mulroney, they decided to beef up the whole uh, intellectual property 
law in Canada when it comes to brand name drugs. And it allows the real development of the brand name pharmaceutical sector. Um, so we created an innovative knowledge-based sector with a surge in R&D investment in the creation of thousands of jobs in the brand name pharmaceutical sector. And yes, absolutely, we did that. Because at the time, under Brian Mulroney, we said, okay, we accept to beef up the patent law in order to help you guys in the brand name pharmaceutical sector. But in exchange, what we want is we want you to invest 10% of all your sales in Canada into R&D in Canada as well in order to develop the sector. It was a bit of a gentleman's agreement, but it worked. So what we saw, if the, the main indicator we use to measure the, the, the intensity of R&D, this is the R&D to sales ratio. So it went from 6% uh, uh, to 11.5% when we look at all patentees. RxND patentees, this is RxND, uh, this is the lobby group for the brand name pharmaceutical sector, so, so the larger pharmaceutical companies in Canada. Um, support of the pharma sector, yes, Quebec is the main cheerleader. Keep in mind, generic sector, it's mostly in Ontario, so Ontario was trying to, 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 to slow down this idea of beefing up the patent law, and Quebec was saying, no, we want this. Uh, uh, so a coalition of entrepreneurs, uh, uh, industrial lobbies, and policymakers strongly advocated, we need to beef up uh, patent law uh, in Canada, beyond what the Eastman Commission was suggesting in 1984. And so, yes, we changed the patent law, but Canada also uh, 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 implemented very important uh, tax credits for research and development as well. Uh, we do have also a very generous pricing policy. When we beef up, beefed up the patent law, we said, well, we'll have this watchdog of the industry, which is uh, the PMPRB, the Patent and Medicines Price Review Board, to make sure that uh, these companies do not abuse their monopoly power. Uh, so we decided to regulate the way we price brand name drugs, patented drugs in Canada. And the problem is that we decided to price the drugs. Uh, we use seven comparator countries, the one that had the highest R&D to sales ratio. And we decided, okay, the maximum we can have in terms of prices in Canada, it's the median of these seven countries. Problem, the basket included the four most expensive countries in the world when it comes to patented drugs. So we have an official policy in Canada, which is still the same, to always be the fourth, the world's fourth, fourth most expensive country, which is kind of weird. Uh, Quebec uh, uh, implemented what we call a 15 years rule. So even if the, there is an expiry of the patent for a specific drug, we give uh, 15 years of exclusivity uh, in Quebec, it was repealed in l last January. I was very happy about that. It was, it was a bit of a fight. Uh, and also a lot of direct subsidies, uh, both in Quebec and Ontario. We'll, we'll see that a bit more closely later on. So if we look in terms of comparison with other countries, so uh, this is Quebec and Canada. So sorry, this is in French. Uh, this is total per capita expenditures in prescription drugs. So this is not just brand name, this is all prescription drugs. And the thing is, after the United States, Quebec, Canada, were the second most costly country in terms of cost per capita. But the thing is, all the other OECD countries, well, almost all other OECD countries do have universal pharmacare, so do have much better access to prescription drugs than what we do in Canada. So in fact, we're paying more. It's not because people have better access. No, we have less access than many other countries. If we compare just the retail prices for the same volume of pharmaceuticals in OECD countries, this is a bit dated, but for different reasons, it's better to, uh, for this to be dated than, than the newer comparisons we have. Uh, what we see is that Canada and Quebec, the relative retail prices, it's even more important than what it is in the United States especially when it comes to generics. We're still protecting a lot the generic sector in Canada, and still the generics in Canada cost twice as much than the prices you see in the United States. Uh, so in terms of much higher prices, 
yes, Canada uh, 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 has much higher prices than most OECD countries. And what for me is uh, 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 more stressful, it's this real yearly growth in per capita uh, drug costs. So this is the growth in drug costs in real terms uh, per capita. And there's two countries among OECD countries uh, uh, b before, well, I excluded uh, 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 Eastern Europe, but otherwise we only have two countries, Ireland and Greece. But this is in, in purchasing power parities. So this is not because the prices increased so much in, in these countries, it's just there was a collapse of the purchasing power parity. So for me, this is very problematic. We're paying the highest cost per, uh, per capita when it comes to drug, and at the same time, we have one of the most important growth in drug cost. So a success story, yes, until the mid-1990s, but then afterwards, basically a collapse of this whole sector in Canada. And what is the response if we have a collapse of the sector? Well, let's shovel more money to drug companies in order for them to, to try to keep up and continue employing people. Uh, so when it comes to R&D uh, to sales ratio in 2011, Canada, I mean, we're here, 5.6%, as compared to, I mean, way behind countries like, you know, Croatia, Cyprus, Spain, Romania. Uh, so, so we need to stop thinking that, oh, wow, we're this uh, power hub uh, in terms of innovation and development in the pharmaceutical sector. So what went wrong? Uh, for example, in Quebec, we, last, uh, we lost almost half of the employment in that sector. Uh, it's, uh, in the rest of Canada, we lost 18%. A bit of an increase for generics. And keep in mind, when we talk about employment in the pharmaceutical sector, I mean, 17% it's R&D. The bulk, it's marketing and administration. This is uh, 57 plus distribution, 59%. S so keep in mind that this is what we're talking about, first and, and especially that the, if you're a sales rep, you're being paid 30% more than if you're a researcher in the sector. So. Um, so what we saw, you, you, we saw the collapse in this R&D to sales ratio. So this is R&D that was well, leveling up, a bit of a decline at the end. But revenues continue to increase during all this time. So, so it's not a question of we need to shovel more money to the sector and, and by some kind of magic employment will grow back and investment uh, in the sector will come back to Canada. Uh, I mean, they're making a lot of money. It's, uh, um, this is something different. This is a comparison I like to do. This is based on the Fortune 500. It's impossible to have uh, 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 profit rates for uh, Canadian drug companies. I mean, these are global companies. So uh, based on the Fortune 500, so this is a comparison of the rate uh, return revenues for dominant drug companies in blue, so the drug companies appearing in the Fortune 500, as compared to returns on revenues for the dominant corporations in other industrial sectors. And what we see is that since the mid-1980s, something's go going on. It's just, wow, there is this increase in terms of profitability in the sector. And even if things, they say, well, it's not going very well, we have a lot of cost cutting, we need to lay off people. Well, 2012 is still the third most profitable year ever for this sector, so we need to keep that in mind as well. Um, so something is happening, and yes, especially when it comes to intellectual property policy, we beefed up uh, exclusivity, monopoly power for uh, the knowledge-based sector. But when we look in terms of innovation, problem is, when it comes to innovation, it's very difficult to measure innovation in therapeutic terms, so what it means in terms of health outcomes for the population. One standard for that is not a very good one. It's the introduction of new molecular entities, uh, the global introductions with decrease. Uh, but the thing is, in the 1960s, it was way easier to uh, introduce something on the market th than today. Uh, uh, this is, for me, way more important. This is, uh, thank you, this is uh, what Physi independent physicians without any conflict of interest 
uh, think in terms of what do, do these drugs represent in terms of ther therapeutic advance as compared to the drugs that are already on the market. So the blue proportion, it's the drugs that have positive therapeutic value. In red, no additional therapeutic value. And in green, negative therapeutic value. The risks uh, uh, are dwarfing the benefits, so these drugs just shouldn't be on the market. So, so in fact, the, the, this is based on the, the, the medical journal Prescrire, and, and for them it's not clear if we have an improvement or a regression of the pharmacopoeia. Uh, I won't go into the, the more conceptual stuff, basically. I, I, I like to use a lot Torstein Veblen to think about corporate welfare. We need to disconnect the, the business capacity to increase their earnings versus the industrial production good that produce material welfare to the community. For, for Veblen, basically, we need to disconnect the two. And business income is based on a logic of regulatory capture, the way you can influence science, you can influence media, the, the way you can build your power institutionally by uh, uh, shaping the dominant discourse and the dominant agenda. So I use Veblen a lot. I won't go into that. And if Veblen and Foucault, in fact, to understand structural power, uh, uh, it's just as compared to Foucault, uh, Foucault saying we cannot accumulate power. There is no center, so you cannot just accumulate power. I think that with the figure of the corporation, you have these huge entities that can deploy all these strategies to, <laughs> I like to call this, this political economy of influence in every interstice of our society to realign the discourse in order to serve their own interests a bit better. So, so it's not perfect, but uh, uh, you do have these strategies in place, and this is what I think it's important to understand. Um, very quickly on this, cost and benefit of innovation policy. So we mentioned there is tax credits, the cost of pricing policy for patented drugs in Canada, the 15 years rule, direct subsidies. I won't go into the calculation. Um, in terms of the pricing policy, it depends to which country you compare yourself. Well, uh, Kevin is here. If we compare ourselves to the UK, the UK represents 2.5% of the world market share when it comes to prescription drugs. Uh, this is, UK is almost double the population than what we have in Canada. And they have universal pharmacare, and everybody, the, the rates in terms of the people not having access to prescription drugs because of financial reasons is way more lower in the UK than what it is in Canada. Canada, half the population, we represent 2.6% of the world market shares when it comes to prescription drugs. So if we had, for example, prices like in the UK, so something like 30% less, uh, no, we pay 30% more here than in the UK, so 20% less, more or less, uh, if we compare ourselves to New Zealand, in New Zealand, they pay 45% less than what it is in Canada. So, so it depends which country you come. And what I did, I decided to remain very conservative. If we go from the, six, uh, from the fourth most expensive country in the world to the world's sixth most expensive country, savings could be something like uh, 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 1.95 billion per year in additional costs for patented drugs. 15 years old in Quebec, the cost 193 million. Direct subsidies, well, uh, Ontario announced its biopharmaceutical investment program in 2008. The year after, Quebec, oh, we need to do the same because otherwise Ontario will be stealing some investment from us. <laughs> so so, so they, they arrived with the new Nouvelle Stratégie Biopharmaceutique, so a couple of millions as well. So if we put that on the table, tax subsidies for our, this is all the stuff we do to attract investment R&D investment in the pharmaceutical sector. So tax subsidies for R&D, in terms of the tax credits, 461 million. Additional costs due to higher prices, under the most conservative assumptions, almost 2 billion. Quebec 15 years rule, direct public subsidies, the minimum 57 million. So in the end, 2.6 billion in terms of direct and indirect public financial support. Now let's compare that to the benefits, the, to the spin-offs we get from this sector. All this is to attract R&D investment. Well, total R&D in 2011 was 960 million, of which 
we paid 461 million in tax credits. So the total private spending in R&D, net of tax credits, half a billion, more or less. So we just paid, so if we, if we take out the tax subsidies, we take the rest, we just paid 2.2 billion in public financial support under the most conservative assumptions in order to generate half a billion in private R&D expenditures and of tax credits. If we used New Zealand style pricing policy, we could have saved up to 8.3 billion when it comes to the price of patented drugs, while still respecting the basic patent law with, with TRIPS agreements and everything. So what are the emerging trends? Well, it's, it's, it's going bad. We have a problem. We need to do something about that. So what do we do? Well, we just announced this, the, the new CETA agreement. Just, oh, the problem is that Canada was not uh, at par with Europe in terms of patent policy. So let's increase patent protection by two years. Uh, uh, and also, well, a right of appeal. I won't go into that. Uh, we did the estimate that what it means is that starting in 2023, it will artificially inflate the price of drugs in Canada by 7%. So which is the way to cope with this problem of, uh, oh, we don't have enough investment, let's just shovel more money. What we see as well, it's uh, most countries develop, <laughs> one of the reasons uh, uh, that in some countries, it's not going so well with the, 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 the pharmaceutical sector is that most countries realize that, well, you know, more than 80% of the new drugs that arrive on the market do not represent any theoretic advance. So some countries decided, let's build the institutional capacity to get value for our money. So this is what we call health technology assessment. So if I'm paying this amount of money for your drug, maybe I, I would be better spending this money in an alternative treatment that would have better health outcomes. So I refuse to pay for some, something that is more expensive and that do not provide additional therapeutic benefits. And what we see right now, it's systematically frontal attacks against this capacity of health technology assessment. Uh, with the NICE, the National Institute for Clinical Excellence in the UK. In BC, with uh, what is uh, happening with the therapeutics initiatives. Uh, okay, they're filming. I, I won't. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, let's just say that uh, uh, they revised the pharmaceutical policy in BC, which was a bit more progressive than in other provinces. And the, the pharmaceutical task force that was put in place to revise the BC pharmaceutical policy uh, 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 committee, nine, nine people, five of them with huge conflict of interest uh, with the drug companies, and the chair of the task force was the, the chair of RXND, the industrial lobby group for the sector. So they are, yes, they have new policy now in BC, especially the elimination of uh, the health technology assessment, the clinical assessment being done by this therapeutics initiative. Uh, they just announced uh, uh, recently that T the TI will get back some of its funding, but basically it's, it's not working the way it was doing before. Uh, something like Viox never entered BC because you had an organization like TI that was there to say, no, this drug is very expensive, you have huge uh, adverse effects linked to this drug, we should not be paying for that. Uh, so it did, did not enter. How many, how many people died uh, of, uh, because of Vioxx in the United States? I, I, you know, there was this recall of Toyota cars two years ago because the pedal was getting stuck. How many people died because of that? I believe between 35 and 40 people. Estimation for Vioxx, 40,000 people die because of taking Vioxx and, instead of a, an alternative treatment. So you, and this is not something that the doctor can know. This is based on the capture of the science of measuring the benefits versus the adverse effects. And you need institutional capacity to, to be able to, to measure that. Uh, uh, now, what we have, deeper regulatory capture, ask for turf organization to increase prices. I'm, uh, I'm still being filmed on, on this. I won't go into the details. Many patient advocacy groups are simply funded by drug companies. 
especially the, the larger one, doesn't mean that these are bad organizations. Most of these organizations, they have fantastic people trying to do the right thing, but uh, conflicts of interest is just everywhere. And sometimes in the way they shape their own discourse, it's really, they see their, their purpose as to shame the governments in order to make sure that the government accept to reimburse any drug at any price. And this is something that has been very, very efficient to make sure that we pay for very expensive prices for drugs that sometimes do not represent any therapeutic advance. Thank you. Uh, just the last point. And the growing influence on public institution, well, rising dependency of, of university of corp on corporate funding and uh, 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 the reorientation of public research in, f in favor of commercial needs is just when we talk about this university industry collaboration, keep in mind that the business model of the industry when it comes to research, it's not about basic research, it's really about product development. A and when we talk about industry university collaboration, most of the time it's to put the, 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 priori the commercial priorities inside the, the public research and this is something we need to take into account. So the response to it's going it's not going well well it, it has been until now just deeper regulatory capture uh, uh, oh yes i wrote that for for kevin i need to to, to quote this uh, <laughs> in corporate capitalism value is not produced only by the production of material wealth but also and foremost by the transformations of social structures norms legislation regulations and culture from there capital accumulation is less the accumulation of production goods then a process of social transformation actively influenced by dominant corporations. So this is to sum up my whole approach when I'm talking about these issues. I think that more theoretically, that sums it well. Thank you. interesting. <laughs> How do I do this? <laughs> Why isn't it showing up here? Oh, good. Okay. Is there a way I can see it there, too? All right. <laughs> well, I can't see it on the screen here, so I'm just going to also refer to what I can see here. That's fine. Um, first of all, thank you very much for the invitation to participate in this workshop. Um, I was very excited to see the title and have an opportunity to talk about uh, corporate welfare in the mining sector, particularly um, using a political perspective. I'm going to talk less about the economic uh, elements, which are absolutely substantial and important to consider. Um, but recently, we've been quite caught up in um, just the depth to which our state is captured by the mining industry and very much in collusion and complicity with uh, mining companies and the sorts of abuses that we're seeing consistently overseas. I'm also going to take a focus mostly on, on our foreign policy as opposed to domestic mining policy, although I think there's important elements there as well to explore further. So. 
First of all, just to give a really broad and quick picture of what the globalization of the Canadian mining sector has amounted to, Canada over the past 25 years has really specialized as a source of equity financing for the most speculative uh, parts of the mining, the, world, the global mining sector. Currently, Canada is home to, uh, well, 75% of the world's mining companies are registered in Canada. That doesn't mean they headquarter here. And some 60% list on Canadian stock exchanges. What that, um, breaking that out just a little bit, um, Canada provides as much equity financing to the global mining industry as London does, more or less. But we provide more than 80% of the equity, individual equity financings. What that boils down to is that Canada has really specialized in financing the junior mining sector, or the exploration phase of mining. So this is one of the reasons why Canadian companies are often the face, the first face that communities encounter when mining activities start to take place on their lands because the Canadian stock exchanges, which are loosely regulated, have really fostered and facilitated a casino-style financing of the mining industry, um, facilitating fast money for some of the most um, speculative actors, particularly in the precious metals sector. So gold and silver uh, figure more than say some of the industrial metals. That said, we do have our complement of large-scale actors too. So we've got some 60, 100 plus companies uh, registered here in Canada, and more than half of their projects are here in Canada. So there's important ways in which the Canadian uh, government and, si and systems, particularly in mining in Canada, is regulated at the provincial level. So talking about uh, mining in Canada and outside of Canada involves some different elements. Um, but nonetheless, we have done lots to facilitate mining expansion here at home as much as we're doing abroad. So I want to focus on some of the, the, the political uh, sides of this. And um, this is a quote from a, a Colombian activist, um, lawyer, unionist, Francisco Ramirez Cuellar, who a number of years ago said, when companies say they obey the law, they mean their law. And it's important to note that throughout the last 30 years, as um, there's been a whole neoliberal, uh, series of neoliberal reforms to mining laws around the world, implemented in some hundred countries, backed by the World Bank agenda, very much supported by Canada, most directly in some countries such as Colombia, where we actually financed um, mining law reforms in the mid-1990s that were approved in 2001 that involved the dismantling of state companies where they existed and f um, sort of uh, loosening up of the administrative and environmental assessment regimes that would enable new projects to be approved and literally um, vast swaths of national territory granted in mining concessions to foreign mining companies um, literally 20% of Peruvian territory is currently under mining concession. Uh, when we talk about potentially if impacted mining communities in that, that country, we're talking of upwards of 50% of campesino communities in the highlands of that country. So major um, territorial uh, capture, potential capture in, in these countries. Um, and what this has given rise to, and I think, and, and where I want to go in terms of the focusing some of the, the anecdotes I'd like to share in terms of the sort of political supports that we're seeing today and the re-entrenchment and deepening entrenchment of this model, both neoliberal model but also neo-colonial model, very importantly, um, has been the rise of tremendous conflict, uh, tremendous pushback. One of the biggest, um, I think it was Ernst, um, Ernst and, <laughs> what's his friend? Uh, anyway, major uh, analyst group this year, uh, and every year, I analyzes what the sort of top ten problems are for the mining industry worldwide. And I think number four on that was was social license, so the lack of community support for new mining projects, and. Um, this was a uh, quite an important conflict that arose uh, in Tambo Grande through the late 1990s uh, in northern Peru and uh, early early 2000s, where mango and lemon farmers contested that half of their town was going to be moved in order to dig it up to build a big open pit gold mine, um, and they successfully sent uh, Manhattan Minerals running after consistent 
five or six years of, of tough struggle um, in which they managed to win their municipality and uh, basically shut down the, com the country. But nonetheless, it's in the context of increasingly conflict, both at the very local level, but they also become very national in many countries and throughout Latin America, which is where I focus, um, we've seen localized conflicts start to push back on the neoliberal mining reforms that have been instituted in their countries, be it in some of the most neoliberal, staunchly neoliberal countries, or in some of the more uh, so-called post-neoliberal states. And it's in that context that I think we're seeing ever deepening support of uh, political supports from the Canadian state to Canadian mining companies. And this was a quote that was um, actually cited by Dr. Tony Bevington from Manchester University when he testified to a uh, Canadian Parliamentary Commission that was hearing on the role of the private sector in uh, overseas development assistance uh, a year ago. And he got this quote from a Latin American Ministry of Mines and Energy who said, as far as I can tell, the Canadian ambassador here is a representative for Canadian mining companies companies. And this has been something that we've started to uh, get a little bit more insight into through a series of access to information requests. Um, just this last year we were able to publish a report and I, I think it's worth telling the story about black fire exploration in Chiapas, Mexico. Um, this is a very small company. I think with questionable social benefit to anybody aside from the two brothers that are the major owners of this private company based in Calgary. Um, operated a relatively small open pit barite mine in Chiapas, the first uh, open pit operation to get started in the state uh, from 2007 to 2009. We started to hear about this conflict uh, in late 2009 and particularly around the time in November of that year when Mariano Abarca, a notable community leader, was assassinated. The mine was closed several days later by the state environmental authority for environmental and social impacts and revelations were published in the Globe and Mail um, about the company having paid, made systematic payments directly into the personal bank account of the local mayor. Um, and this came to light when the company complained uh, that it was being extorted by the mayor and that the mayor was asking for too many favors, including a night with this former Playboy mo model, Nierka Marcos. In response, we sent a delegation to Chiapas. At that time, what we knew about what was going on with the embassy with the, was that the embassy was taking sort of a backseat position saying, oh, well, the investigation of the murder, that's responsibility of the Mexican state. Um, there was actually a very high-level delegation that happened to go down at the same time with minister then, who was then the foreign minister, uh, Peter Kent, the governor general, Michel Jean, at the time. They refused to meet with those who were affected. Um, and Peter Kent, uh, who's said a number of charming things at that time, reinforced his belief in the responsibility of how responsible Canadian mining companies are. And we had information at this time that the embassy had sent a political counselor uh, to Chiapas at the end of January and actually spoke with some of the affected communities um, at the time. And so when we sent a delegation to Chiapas together with the United Steelworkers and Common Frontiers in March of that year to interview local communities to meet with the embassy, we tried to get a copy of that report. We wanted to know what the embassy knew and why or how they were responding the way they did. We weren't able to get the report. So some months later, we submitted an access to information requested, uh, in information to access request. And 18 months after that, um, received 960 pages, which gave us a good sense of what was going on, not just post-murder, but actually starting from before the mine, comp the mine was actually installed. And I think this is really notable in terms of this, this concept that companies don't need the state. We actually saw the embassy holding Blackfire's hand. Um, and this isn't Gold Corps, this isn't Barrett Gold, this is a two-bit private company from Calgary. Um, and what we saw is that the embassy hadn't just visited the mine in January, but had actually visited at least three times before starting from before the mine went into installation. Um, and, and that within the first year, the absolute essential nature of the embassy supports in terms of having that mine opened. In Mexico, you have a situation where the federal government controls mining regulation. So the state has very little s incentive to actually involve itself. So the embassy was ne needed to put pressure onto the state government to say, hey, you guys need to support this mine. And that's what they did. And so as of September of 2008, Shortly after the mine finally gets started up, shortly after the, mine, the mining company manages to get a couple of agreements with local communities, the m we, there's an email from Blackfire to the embassy uh, political counselor saying, 
say thanks to the ambassador for us because we couldn't have done it without you. Um, the embassy is absolutely aware of growing opposition to the mine throughout 2008, is absolutely aware that thousands of people are marching in the street against the, the operations. And in 2009, this is a very crucial moment because this is a time at which a uh, delegation travels 13 hours from Chiapas to Mexico City to protest in front of the Canadian embassy, and Mariano Abarca, who's later murdered, uh, talks directly to a Canadian embassy official and says, there are uh, shock troops that are people that are armed, who are working for the mining company, who are intimidating those of us who are opposed in questioning the mine operation. 1,400 letters are received by the embassy. That's information that we found out through these documentation, this documentation expressing dire worry for the life of Mariana Barco when he is arrested off of the street two weeks later. The embassy, in, as opposed to taking action to make sure that Mariano's life is, a, is, is respected and recognizing and knowing, or there's indications that the, ma the embassy knew that the charges that were laid, trumped up charges that were laid in order to get Mariano um, arrested were actually filed by the company representatives itself, op responds in, in response to s secure the workers and the interests of the company based on a single email from the company that same month. They make a visit to Chiapas a couple of months later when they visit the mine site and talk to state officials but um, make no effort to talk to or investigate the serious allegations that they've heard about um, opponents to the mine being threatened and intimidated. A couple months later we have the murder and most importantly, even post-murder, post-mine closure, and post-evidence that the company has been bribing the local mayor, which has led to an RCMP investigation that's still open, uh, we see another uh, evidence that the embassy continues to stand up for the company and even advise it on how to use NAFTA to sue the Chiapas government. So, and in August of this year, I had an opportunity to visit the embassy with members of the Abarca family and who, who stated their concern to the embassy officials, asking for them to push for justice in Mariano's case, to push for finalization of the, Im the corruption and investigation against Black Fire, and to ensure that the lives of other Mexican activists who are being threatened and criminalized as a result of Canadian mining operations, um, that they would help to protect them. The embassy made no effort to defend its actions. In fact, and when we asked them what could they do in the case of, uh, of other serious threats against Mexican activists, they said that that would be tantamount. Uh, talking to Mexican officials on, on the behalf of other Mexicans that would be threatened would be tantamount to inferior in sovereignty. Meanwhile, pressuring the Chiapas state was not uh, considered interfering in state sovereignty. So we're seeing, I think, this is a, a, a micro example, but it's one of many examples. We've been able to at least document 12 other examples in which the Canadian Embassy has intervened on Canadian corporations' behalf in situations of conflict where there's either direct opposition from communities or serious abuses that have been in, in, um, made evident, or in which there are efforts to make progressive reforms to mining laws. And we've got at least 12 that we've been able to document. I think some of the bigger corporations have uh, very particular actors working on their behalf, and this is where I wanted to get a little bit into the revolving door. It's notable um, that fresh out of office in 1993, Brian Mulroney was appointed to the International Advisory Committee of Barrett Gold, where he remains. Um, John Chrétien, now working for Ivanhoe, Ivanhoe Resources, uh, notable for its investments in, in Burma. Gold Corps has former diplomat on its board of directors uh, and also has its own private jet with which it can get parliamentarians to go down to Guatemala when it needs, th needs them to, such as we saw this time last year. But also just the level of what's happening with Canadian foreign policy. Um, the one, one of the big things that Mining Watch Canada has been consistently advocating for is that we need mandatory uh, regulation to control the overseas operations uh, from Canada of uh, the overseas operations of, of Canadian mining companies. What we have, though, is a voluntary um, regimen that's been called the Corporate Social Responsibility Strategy, which is very well designed to protect business, um, to better promote its interests, and not to do anything to shore up, um, to, to restrict, to deal with abuses, or to, to limit them at any way. 
Um, and, and I think I'll just focus on, on two elements of this. One that's been very controversial in, in, in the media in the last couple of years has been how s the Canadian International Development Agency, which is now being incorporated into the Department of Foreign Affairs, uh, has an expanded mandate to promote strategic relationships between NGOs and the mining sector and mining companies in, in countries in which they're involved. This is um, not just uh, a way of trying to gain a foothold into local communities. I think it's also a very convenient way to divide civil society here in Canada. Um, and right now, in terms of the process of, of the merger that's happening uh, with, with the restructuring happening within foreign affairs, we've in the last month it's come to light that Rio Tinto Elcan, the CEO, is also on the advising board for that process. And, and I think in terms of policy change and the deepening and entrenching, further entrenchment of neocolonial and neoliberal policies in the, in, in the mining sector in different countries in which Canada is invested, um, it's absolutely horrendous to see that the Canadian government has really taken the lead in terms of having a seven-year moratorium on new mining projects in Honduras lifted this last year with a CETA-sponsored uh, mining law uh, that was approved in January of this year, uh, which is not only going to open the mining sector once again in a country that is now uh, the murder capital of, of, of the region um, and in which we just saw uh, elections take place on Sunday where foreign observers were intimidated and threatened, where members of the opposition uh, party, the new party Libre, were a couple were killed on, on Friday night. Um, that this is the country in which Canada has chosen to uh, really get involved deeply in terms of policy change, including a 2% tax on new mining operations that would be given t for security uh, in a moment in which the police service is being militarized and we're now seeing soldiers uh, being trained and going out with police uh, in order to protect uh, economic interests. Um, and just finally, uh, I think sort of the lock and key on, on these policies, and this has been ongoing the last 20 plus years from Mulroney right through to Harper, has been the free trade agenda, which um, extractive industry companies have been very um, happy to, to use. Um, we saw this happen in, in the, the case with Blackfire in Chiapas. They threatened an 800 million lawsuit against, against the state. Pacific Rim Mining, another junior mining company based in Va Vancouver, is currently suing the state of El Salvador for $315 million uh, in the World Bank International Tribunal um, for the state not having granted it a permit to put an open pit mine into operation in the northern part of that country, where local communities were tremendously opposed because of the impacts that they've seen of, of large-scale mining on the lives of other communities. Infinito Gold, another private Calgary-based firm that's uh, threatening Costa Rica with a billion-dollar suit, and Peru, which is already facing $6 billion in suits, also facing uh, threats from another junior company in Vancouver. What does this add up to? <laughs> Where is this all going? Nowhere good. We saw uh, two days ago the launch of Canada's Global Markets Action Plan, which included, as part of its um, plan to further promote Canadian economic interests abroad, the coining of the concept of economic diplomacy. What does this mean? All diplomatic assets of the government of Canada will be marshaled on behalf of the private sector in order to achieve the stated objectives within key foreign markets. I don't know how they could further marshal dipl the, dip the diplomatic service on, on behalf of ca uh, Canadian mining companies, but whatever it takes, they're going to do it. And I think the costs of this, aside from the externalization of, of the cost of large-scale mining, which is part and parcel of the model of mining that, that we live with here at home and that people are living with abroad, um, in, terms of the ex in terms of the externalization of both the social and environmental impacts, I think we're also seeing the undermining of democracy and a real costs to democracy both here and, and, and in other countries in which Canadian mining companies are operating. We heard the news a month and a half ago around how our overseas spy service is gathering intelligence on mines and energy in ministries such as in Brazil. Um, we know that the spy agencies, the federal, agency, uh, federal government and uh, private uh, extractive companies have been meeting regularly to share information, um, including the, and that they've stepped up surveillance of indigenous and environmental groups that are opposed to the tar sands. Um, wouldn't be surprised if other projects as well. And that there's an ever closer association. We're seeing this discursive change in the last two years where the federal government is now um, making a closer association between the concept of economic interests and national interests, which then justifies and implies that those opposed are now a security threat to Canada. Um, 
this reduction of funding on the NGO sector, and millions being spent on auditing to carry out a witch hunt to try to intimidate uh, civil society organizations here in Canada uh, to not participate in political activity. And a silencing of federal scientists. We could also talk about the uh, real um, retrograde setbacks in terms of environmental legislation here and other efforts to try to privatize indigenous lands in Canada, um, et cetera. So I think that's the end <laughs> of the depressing picture. Um, and I, I would agree in terms of the, the need to advocate for uh, stronger institutions and, and, and stronger legislation in Canada. I just think that we've got a tremendous political problem that we have to get over first. Thanks. Uh, so my question is primarily directed towards Kevin. Um, I was wondering, because especially during this bailout phase when banks are being bailed out for financial uh, misgivings and whatnot, there were some who voiced, um, let's say, opposition to this, saying that the banks should not have been bailed out at all, whereas others, in I guess a less vocal crowd, have said something to the effect of there should have been a bailout, but of the individuals and communities that were most affected by the financial crisis. Um, I'm just wondering if you think this is something that's rhetorical, something you can really only say after the fact, or if there's any validity to that concept in itself? Um. I, think I, I think it's a really good question, and it's, um, and it's, and, and it's, and it's one that actually is, is, that is quite difficult to answer, because um, if, the government, if governments hadn't bailed out the banks, I think that individuals would have suffered hugely. And, um, and, and so in a way, governments needed to bail out the banks. I, I think to look at, we, we have to look though deeper into that problem. I think that um, the, uh, the issue is, um, should we have had a banking system that was too big to fail? I think that's a really important question. And, um, and, and could governments have done something about that? And of course they could have. And, um, and once, then once governments bail out the banks, what do they do? Um, and the worst thing I think they can do is simply allow them to continue as they were before, and um, and to be and to and to be quick to um, reprivatize them, and because that seems to be that seems to be happening now, um, governments do um, uh, are keen to um, to to reprivatize um, without real without many conditions. And, um, and I think it would, be, would make much more sense to actually break up the banks. Uh, since the crisis, there's actually been a concentration of the financial sector, and I think that governments actually in controlling um, uh, bank assets uh, could do something about that. Um, in, in, in terms of, but I think in terms of, 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 of should they, shouldn't they have bailed out, I, I think they didn't really, I think, my, I think most governments probably didn't really have a choice. And the world would look a lot worse today probably if they hadn't have bailed them out then um, then the fact that they did uh, but of course uh, I, that's a very that's that, that's a difficult statement to make because actually I, I don't necessarily want to see public resources go into bailing out banks um, but maybe actually as I said what what, what what should have been done is that we should have um, we should have bailed out the banks but then we um, then we should have imposed much tighter controls over them and actually saw them as state as state assets uh, so that we're actually nationalizing the banking sector as opposed to providing um, as opposed to simply bailing them out and then um, as I said being in a rush to reprivatize them Uh, hi. So just a question. It sounded from your presentation that, uh, Kevin, that you were speaking to the rehabilitation of the term or the widening of the term corporate welfare. It's usually been used as a cudgel with a fairly narrow focus. Uh, and I just wondered perhaps from, from the different members of the panel to what extent um, 
the concept of corporate welfare might be useful in the different areas that you're tackling. So from, from the mining sector, it, it feels to me more like criminal behavior as opposed to welfare, but, but you could, uh, so I'm just trying to get a sense of to what extent is this term useful uh, politically to, uh, to widen the cracks or to, or to find a weak chink? Hmm. Should I respond to that? Uh, just quickly, I, um, I am trying to widen the term, especially in the way that the term is used in, um, in a North, North American sense. So I definitely am trying to um, broaden it. The, um, is it useful to do so? Um, politically, actually, corporate welfare as a term just uh, actually does play quite well. In, um, in, in highlighting the fact that corporations get a huge amount from the state. So politically, I think it's, uh, I think it's, it's, a, it's a loaded term, and that's both a good and a bad thing. Um, what I think is important is that um, we view corporate welfare alongside social welfare, as I said, and we actually see these two things as, um, uh, as, as, as being um, part of just what the state does. And, um, and so that's why, for me, it's, it's useful. Um, I, I, did, I, I was reluctant to use this term, though, for some time, and I did try and think about other terms that might be used, um, corporate-centered social policy, corporate-centered public policy, those kind of pl playing around with those ideas, but it actually seemed to me to be it seemed to me to be more useful to reconceptualize and to um, integrate within um, uh, the um, sort of academic discourse the notion of corporate welfare in the same way that the welfare state was integrated into academic discourse. But obviously that takes time and there is a risk, especially in North America where corporate welfare means something. In, in Europe, corporate welfare means much less. So it's actually easier to reconceptualize corporate welfare. Um, in North America, obviously, it does mean something. It means it means something slightly, or, or it's it, it, it's defined uh, more completely. But it's and, it, and it's and it's defined, unfortunately, by the right. And so there, so there, there, there is a. I, I do accept there's a risk, um, but I, I I can't think of a better term at the moment. <laughs> no, it's an interesting question, uh, and in order to to, to kind of. Uh, uh, bring back the concept uh, in academic terms. Uh, I, I leave it to Kevin. This, this is not wh what I'm trying to do, uh, 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 but I, I think this is an interesting thing to do. It's just the way usually I, I academically I discuss the, these things. It's more about trying to understand the nature of what I what I call corporate capitalism. So, what are the dynamics of capital accumulation? in a society dominated by dominant corporations that have huge influencing power over uh, existing institutions. But politically, I, I must say, the, the, the use of corporate welfare can, can be very useful. It's just when I meet with uh, policymakers, this is the type of term I like to use, corporate welfare, regulatory capture, uh, and I like to present myself, you know, as a... Uh, fiscal conservative, I want to have value for the money I'm spending, you know, uh, uh, and also uh, when it comes to, 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 to speci more specifically to drugs, it's just, well, I, I do want to have more market competition. Uh, by its essence, market competition lowers profit rates. Uh, and what we see in the dynamics in corporate capitalism, it's uh, all these capacity to circumvent market competition in a s with a series of different strategies. Uh, and w what I like to say is, no, no, I want to, bring, uh, we, uh, we should have a tendering process for most of the drugs. I think it, should be, it could be a great idea to lower down the prices. This is what they do uh, in New Zealand, for example. Uh, and how to adapt the mechanism of market company. And this is kind of, a, I, I sound kind of very conservative and right wing here, but, but these uh, politically, and strategically, these terms can also be very fruitful in order to convince it. <laughs> well, when I'm doing uh, interviews with the uh, uh, radio shows in Calgary, it's just I talk about market competition, and, and uh, because it w if I defend universal pharmacare, it's just oh, this is the big state, big programs. Uh, no, I'm talking about market competition. And right now, you we're fixing prices. It's corporate welfare. This is not, not acceptable. Uh, and yes, uh, this type of political discourse, I think, I I is a very interesting counter discourse politically. Academically, I leave it to Kevin. Uh, he's doing an amazing job. <laughs> I, uh, well, I guess the 
narratives that we tend to use haven't been framed so much in terms of corporate welfare up until now. We've um, because we've been really advocating uh, in a context in which the government and industry has been pushing corporate social responsibility. Um, one of the counter narratives has been to talk a lot about corporate accountability. Um, that's been sort of one of the key framings. I think one of the other key framings that we end up getting into a lot is is talking more about collective and indigenous rights and sort of identifying those independently from um, individual rights. So those, those, of course, come into to play as well. And I think one of the other sort of key framings that's coming out of Latin America and and um, when when you raise the the piece around what sort of capitalism is is this kind of corporate welfare actually fostering I do think in the extractive system we're, we're talking about predatory capitalism we're talking about very we're talking about casino style um, high rents um, high costs uh, business that is offloading the cost, especially onto directly affected communities and workers, and that's having very narrow capture of benefits for a narrow group of people. I actually think one of the things that we could do better is getting better about talking about some of the narrow ways in which that those rents are being captured, um, and and that's something that we've talked at Mining Watch about trying to do in the coming year, especially especially now that some of the discourse has been shifting um, into trying to equate mining with development which is precisely what communities have been saying, this is not development or this is not the development that we're looking for in many cases. And so um, in that, that frame, we have been looking to sort of more, more strengthen the tax justice uh, frame and, and look at who benefits and, and, and who loses in a little bit more concrete terms. Okay. Uh, well, my question is mostly directed to Kevin. Uh, it's actually the, the question that you posed yourself about how corporate welfare can be used to reduce corporate harm and increase social justice. Uh, my question is, can it? Uh, and does this sort of like reproduce the idea that corporations are more efficient, uh, they would be more efficient of using the, the money as opposed to giving it directly to, to people? Uh, and also in terms of uh, like when labor sort of like rallies for uh, companies to be bailed out because they're sort of threatened as well, that sort of also uh, n like narrows the, 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 beneficiaries, the beneficiaries of the of, of welfare because it's only targeting a certain population that are employed not only in that company but only in the wage sector. And it also tends to sort of like uh, reproduce this whole like male wage earner model uh, as well. Uh, so anyway, so my question is, can it be used? Because my answer would probably be no, but w what's your sort of take on that? And Chris, do you want to ask a question for me? Oh, sure. Yeah. Um, my question's for Jennifer. Um, you talked a little bit at the end of your talk about the discursive change toward economic interests as national interests. I was just hoping if you could elaborate a bit uh, more on this uh, around the question of when did this change occur? Um, how else is it manifesting, and why hasn't there been more pushback? Really great question. And um, can corporate welfare be used in order to increase corporate um, responsible behavior? I guess is the is the nub of that question. And um, and I th I think it can, but um, that but it. Um, but obviously, what we need to do, if it's to, if corporate welfare is really to change corporate be behavior, um, is that we have to, for one, we have to think about corporate welfare much more generally. We have to think about corporate welfare being about something other than subsidies. This is about the way in which capitalism is run within countries, and um, the way in which capitalism is run within different countries um, has a huge impact on how corporations behave within that country. Um, and the um, and so how responsible they are at the moment. What seems to be happening is that corporate welfare is being used to reward bad corporate behaviour, um, and um, and because there isn't the, there isn't the, there isn't this kind of debate. The issue of procurement, for example, um, companies are giving procurement contracts um, unconditionally. In the UK, a number of companies are being giving more and more given more and more contracts to run services when they're being, invest being, being investigated for fraud, uh, and when they're not actually delivering services in anything that looks like an efficient way. 
Um, and something the Public Accounts Committee has raised is, can't we do something about that? Can't we actually be much more, uh, much more selective about how we um, um, award procurement contracts, for example? Uh, in relation to, uh, in relation to um, the, 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 the broader question, um, the, the, as I said, I actually, I actually think that corporations are always getting assistance from the state. Uh, they just get different types of assistance from the state. Uh, and sometimes governments, like governments uh, aid corporations by relaxing regulations, allowing them to employ people at, um, at, um, uh, on, on poverty wages, for example. Um, or, um, or, or, or reducing their corporate tax rate or, or, or reducing regulations more generally. What I would argue is that we could, like, we could look at this a different way um, and, actually, uh, and actually think about ways in which um, the, uh, the, the dominant model isn't towards lowest common denominator but actually is about um, lifting um, wage rates. Uh, and actually, that, reduce, that, that reduces the cost of the state. Because at the moment, actually, what states are doing is, is they're topping up wages uh, for, for, for low-paid workers. So it's, it's, it's a really complex issue, um, I, I would say, because corporate welfare is actually, uh, um, you know, includes a whole range of things. But in a nutshell, what corporate, wealth, what corporate welfare is about, is about to me is the way in which capitalism is, is run and managed, and then the way in which corporations make a profit within that, within, uh, within that um, system. And then um, how we can give other inducements and other incentives to corporations um, other than encourage the kind of predatory behavior that we've talked about. So it's about how we use um, the co corporate welfare in order to um, uh, change behavior, and I think that... I think that overall, I think that we, that that's that's possible because some countries are already doing that. Some countries actually are much more demanding in terms of how they, um, in terms of expectations from companies and how they run capitalism. Um, in relation to, does this um, are there problems with that in terms of um, reproducing a, a male breadwinner model? It, it is if we think about corporate welfare just in terms of subsidising um, um, the big heavy industries. Uh, but as I said, corporate, uh, corporate welfare for me actually goes far beyond that. Um, there are other problems in terms of maintaining uh, corporations that, uh, that, will, that will then push up prices and, um, and ultimately consumers will pay. I mean, that's a, that's, that, that is a, um, is a risk. Um, but, but I think, you know, as I, I, you're right to raise the issue, but as I, the, the, as I said, the more I've thought about this, the more I, I, I just think that actually the, the idea that corporations don't have assistance from the state, any, uh, most corporations don't have assistance from the state in some way, it, 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 it is a myth um, because they do. And we just have to then think, well, then, we just, th then we have to change the nature of the debate. Because then if we accept that corporations need the state, we have to ask them what we can then expect from them. Um, not just in terms of the, their sort of general behavior, but, but their tax behavior apart from anything else. Um, and if I could just maybe add on that that question a little bit, because I think there's some interesting examples too, where um, there have been some public policies that have been implemented in in certain countries that we could point to that have been very helpful, I think, to better protecting the interests of mining affected communities in particular. Um, I, both, both a couple of good examples from here and a couple of good examples from abroad. I think right now in in Latin America, you're seeing, um, we're seeing different efforts to try to push back and and limit or restrict some of the most voracious and devastating types of, of mining. Costa Rica right now has an all out ban on open pit gold mining. Um, six states, provinces within Argentina do as well. What's interesting about and and now there's also legislation or or efforts to protect and and further uh, implement legislation in, in Argentina and Colombia to protect uh, fragile ecosystems that are important to vital water supplies for communities. But I think what's important in terms of the lessons that are coming from those states in terms of how to implement those and make sure that they stay in place um, in a system in which you know that those companies have tremendous economic and political influence has been to combine them with, with strong social movements. Um, and where the the legal and, and technical responses to the mining industry have had some uh, advance. They've been supported by really strong uh, mobilizations, usually cross-sectoral mo mobilizations, both at the local and national level. Um, 
And I think here at home, there's a couple of important struggles that have been fought by indigenous communities to really start to question um, the free entry model of mining, where uh, prospectors have can go on to private property and collectively home owned property without any need for a permit um, and or like with very, very basic and, and, and lax regime to do so. And we've just there was a really important court um, decision in Yukon recently that found that uh, the Ross uh, River Diné First Nation has the right to prior consultation and consent prior to any concessions being granted on its land. And I think increasingly we're going to see more and more cases of that sort being fought at that level, not at the stage of exploration, not at the stage of, of exploitation, but rather even before there's a concession. So before there's a project, before there's a company on your land, more defense strategies at that level. And I, and I think those are valuable and important aspects of, of the struggles that we're seeing fought. Um, on the question with regards to economic and national interest, I think it's particularly been in the last two, I mean, we've started to look a bit at this question with um, the International Civil Liberties Monitoring Group and, and post 9-11, within the anti-terrorist strategy in Canada, there has been more inclusion and um, seeing uh, indigenous and environmental groups that are question uh, questioning uh, economic interests as being a threat to the state. Um, I think it's been from 2005 or 2006 on that there's been um, some of that quite explicitly laid out and, and certainly evidence that, that the RCMP and CSIS have been carrying out more spy activities. Um, but in terms of discursively and really me in more media spaces, I think the last two years in particular, um, with the conservative government's desperate attempt to protect the interests of corporations in the tar sands, and with quite significant and, and substantial protests, both in the US and in Western Canada, um, against the construction of the pipelines that are necessary to ship that oil out of the, out of the tar sands, um, that We've been seeing more of that that shift from Joe Oliver and others that have been in, in those positions to do so um, that have gotten notable attention. And um, so I, I, I actually think that there has been pushback and I think that the pushback has been more in those spaces, maybe not as much here in Ottawa. Um, I think in terms of uh, some of the efforts to divide and crack down on, on the civil society sector, that we're seeing a much reduced civil society sector that's actually super constrained in terms of where it's going. And, and unfortunately, I think people have been, organizations have been backing into their own spaces as opposed to um, and backing into their own spaces and trying to protect what's, what's theirs as opposed to trying to find more uh, assertive strategies to push back against the, the broader economic agenda right now. But, um, but I do think in terms of the tar sands and some of those, those demonstrations that there's, there are significant protests um, going on and it's precisely for those reasons that, that the government's been, been speaking the way it has and, and trying to criminalize the way it has. I heard a, a joke on the um, on the hill in Ottawa. Uh, Peter Ken being the lowest paid lobbyist for for the oil industry. <laughs> I thought this was a very good. Um, on the first question about the um, starting by mentioning the question of efficiency of corporations. Uh, I think uh, one literature I, I think is amazing. It's about the birth, the origins of corporations, late 19th century in the United States. For example, uh, William Roy on socializing capital. Uh, and in this literature, what you see is the rise of corporations has nothing to do with increasing productivity or, or increasing efficiency. It's really the capacity. It's uh, increasing the, the sabotage capacity of specific organizations over the community. Uh, and, and uh, for example, Torstein Veblen, when he discusses the issue, it's always about the sabotage capacity. So basically, the, your capacity to capture strategic assets of the community and create maximum damage or, uh, well, this is, uh, um, when you're blackmailing somebody, so, so you're asking for a ransom, uh, not to use your sabotage capacity. Uh, and Veblen defines the intangible assets of the corporations, first and foremost, uh, well, by its efficiency, but by its predatory efficiency over the community instead of its uh, ef productive efficiency. I think it's uh, something interesting. Um, on the question, uh, should we provide corporate welfare 
in exchange of uh, if they respect uh, social corporate resp uh, corporate social responsibility or, or if we receive uh, spin-offs. I think e yes, absolutely. I think it's uh, one good way to think about the issue is just uh, if we provide privileges to any organization, well, we as a citizen, we should expect something in return. And uh, uh, so, for example, a negotiation of CETA, one of the, the, the suggestions we're making at the time is that, okay, if we extend the patent term by two years, this is what we should be asking in exchange in order to make sure that we uh, get out of this system of uh, uh, huge, massive, public, direct and indirect subsidies. Uh, South Korea, Japan, uh, the way the, 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 the state interacts for, with corporations can be way more productive, but we need to keep in mind one thing about the nature of the corporation itself. If we define it first and foremost by its intangible assets in terms of uh, sabotage capacity, uh, let's keep in mind that corporation exists because the states accept these forms of organization to exist as well. So we should have also a more radical questioning about is it the most efficient forms of productive organizations we want in our community? This is so we need to ask also ask this question. Thanks. Um, well, I think we're almost out of time and it is Friday afternoon and it is dark out. So we'll I will pass the mic to Kevin, who wants to say one more thing. It's going to be very short. I, I, I do promise. Because um, actually, I, I, I mean, I know it's Friday afternoon, um, and, and um, it's going to. But actually, I, I, in terms of this discussion, what's really interesting um, to me, and actually, this is maybe what combines the uh, uh, some of the issues here, is that actually not talking about corporate welfare to go back to the issue of corporate welfare. Um, I think it helps to reinforce the myth. Um, and, and this goes back to both your points, um, that, um, that corporations are a, a, a incredibly efficient. Um, and actually, what that, what that, what that has meant is, is that most of the um, programs being put in place by governments now, in the name of neoliberalism and the idea of efficient corporations, actually is, is not reinforcing market behavior at all. It's actually, it's actually, just, um, it's actually undermining markets. Um, so markets actually, are, so, so the corporations involved in these kinds of markets um, have the state on board to, 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 to lobby for them. This is not about, this is about, not about the market, this is about powerful state interests. Uh, or in the case of the pharmaceutical interests uh, interest, or the healthcare more, uh, health, health sector more generally. Um, this is about corporations actually being given a license to trade within these areas um, with guaranteed levels of income. Uh, or virtually guaranteed levels of income. It's not the market, the, the market actually is being undermined. It's not being strengthened, but we think it's being strengthened because of the dominance of neoliberalism and the discourse that exists. Um, which again, you know, goes back to, which, which is why I think we need to actually address the discourse. Um, that's just what I wanted to add. Thanks. Okay, so I'd really like to uh, thank our presenters today for their uh, really fascinating um, discussions and particularly want to thank Kevin for being here in Canada with us in the cold and and being such a great uh, addition to our Institute while he's been here I also want to thank Donna for her hard work for organizing this event thanks so much Donna and also to the uh, student journalists from um, Carleton who taped this event so these presentations will be available to others across the World Wide Web and thanks to our audience so uh, Thanks, everybody. We'll see you soon. <laughs> <laughs>